pleasure for me to welcome you out this evening to the 27th Paul L. Arrington Memorial Lecture. Uh, we're excited about the program this evening, and I'm confident that you're going to find it to, to be both informative and stimulating. Uh, before we uh, introduce our speaker for the evening, however, I would like to make some acknowledgments. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Arrington. Mrs. Arrington, could you stand and be recognized? I'd also like to publicly acknowledge those who have served with me on the Arrington Lecture Committee. They have included Warren Johnson and, and Joe Grady. We've had a third member also help us a great deal, although not an official member of the committee. He has been very instrumental in helping us throughout the planning process, and that is Paul Bowes. Uh, later, uh, Paul will be introducing our guest speaker. There are several sponsors for our program this evening. They are listed in your uh, program, and I won't bother mentioning them. We've also included in your program some biographical information about uh, Paul Arrington's uh, accomplishments and professional development, and I would certainly encourage you to read that information. Uh, Dr. Arrington had an international rec uh, recognition and uh, uh, was recognized throughout the world for his pioneer work dealing with uh, population regulation and the interaction between predator-prey populations. And I have had occasion to reflect back on my introduction to the work of Paul Arrington as an early graduate student. My mentors at that time considered the writings of, of uh, Dr. Arrington to be classics and to be a very integral part of our training as well like professionals. And I suspect that my experience was not unique. Uh, Dr. Arrington's work is very well known and very well respected among those in the wildlife profession. Recently, I had the occasion to spend some time in the archives of the ISU library, and uh, I took that occasion to uh, spend some time perusing the material they had on the special collections on the career and life of Paul Arrington, and I must say that I was very impressed with what I found. Uh, I discovered, for instance, that Dr. Arrington has published over 200 uh, titles in his professional career. Uh, these have included uh, six monograph-length articles. They've also included four popular books, and those popular books are mentioned in your program. I think particularly noteworthy in Dr. Arrington's career, however, it was his ability to bring his research findings to the lay audience. And I found that he had published in 30 different popular journals and magazines. Uh, either uh, printed material or reprinted material of work that he had done. And I think that's to his credit, his ability to convey his scientific findings to the lay audience as well as to the technical audience. I was particularly impressed with the reviews that he received for his first popular book entitled Of Men and Marshes. And I'd like to uh, share with you three brief quotes from the reviews which he received back in 1958 for this uh, first book that was published. One reviewer said the following, a fine, genuine book in which Dr. Arrington has distilled a lifetime of thought and seeing. Nearly every paragraph contains vignettes of Arrington's little critters, the mink, the muskrat, egrets, and other marsh life that we know that he knew so intimately. Tying these portraits together is a man's simple, colorful philosophy that will be felt by anyone who has ever fallen through the ice, watched a hunting mink, or seen geese against the snow or moon. It is a good writing, and in some places, it is beautiful writing. Another reviewer said, Dr. Arrington's important book, endorsed by leading conservationists, is filled with an abiding love of the out of doors and the wisdom of a mind that, for all its detailed scientific knowledge, is yet warmly human and humble. And yet a third review, I have never met Paul L. Arrington, but I have long felt a personal debt for the insight which his ecological studies have given into nature's ways. It is an intensely personal book, written out of in intimate experience by one who, better than any other American, sees the marsh world with nature's eyes. And I think the last statement in our program is worth repeating. Paul Larrington passed along a priceless heritage of conservation wisdom and insight to those of us who have had the opportunity to read what he wrote, who have benefited from his skills, and who must continue to question and enlarge upon his findings. And it's a great deal with pleasure and pride that we recognize and pay, pay tribute to Dr. Arrington uh, as a person and as a scientist. I'd now like to call on Paul Vose from the Department of Ecology to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. 
Thank you, Dr. Best. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, privilege to introduce our speaker this evening. Part of the opportunity that I got to do that was because I was out in Oregon when the Spotted Owl Saga began. And uh, in 1972, Howard White had a student named Eric Forsman who began the study of spotted owls. And uh, I can always tell you that the sage old wise bald head told Eric Forsman that uh, after he finished his first study on spotted owls, he should go somewhere else besides Oregon State and should, he should study some other species because he'd uh, uh, shorten his lifespan as an investigator if he spent it all on spotted owls. Well, Eric Forsman is one of the foremost uh, uh, people knowledgeable on spotted owls and still works closely with our speaker this evening. So it goes to tell you that, that uh, you can be in on the beginning, but it's good to hang around for the end because it's liable to turn out differently than what you thought. Uh, the whole question of spotted owls uh, fell into Chuck Meslow's lap after Howard White, who was the major professor for Eric, died. And uh, Chuck was assistant unit leader and became a unit leader at Oregon State University and took over the uh, spotted owl work. And it's gone from an interaction study between an animal and its habitat to something much larger than that. It's now something that challenges, in some cases, timber harvest practices. It uh, challenges, in some cases, the Endangered Species Act because of the political aspects of, of the questions that we'll hear about tonight. And also, it's very clear that it challenges the uh, wise management and sustained yield of some of our forest uh, uh, stocks within, within the West. So our speaker tonight, uh, has then has managed, worked, and found funding for spotted owl studies when such was difficult. And he'd probably tell you that it went from something very difficult to something overwhelming in a short period of time, and he wished it had been more evenly flowing throughout the time that he has been involved with the study. So he has managed the funding, the students, the controversy, and the biology to become one of the foremost uh, authorities on spotted owls in the country and tonight he will share that. So I would like to introduce a gentleman who got two degrees from the University of Minnesota, went from there to Wisconsin, and spent some time studying cycles with Dr. Lloyd B. Keith in Canada while he was there. And then, because he had a great desire to be cooled after that warm experience in Canada, he spent some time at the University of North Dakota in Fargo, and then went on from there to Oregon State University, where he has been there now for some 20 years as leader of the uh, Oregon Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. E. Charles Meslow. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Uh, Paul knows some other stories about Meslow, and he refrained from uh, telling all of them tonight. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Arrington, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to share with you some observations on uh, some 20 years of trying to understand the spot at all. I'm going to start off like a good bureaucrat and attempt to deny responsibility for what I'm going to say here tonight. <laughs> I am a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee. I do not represent the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here tonight. Throughout most of the spotted owl wars, if you will, the controversy that surrounded the animal for a number of years, the Fish and Wildlife Service has given me free reign to speak out on the biology of the animal. But they've always cautioned me that I do not make any inference that I represent the policy of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Interior, or the administration. I do not do so here tonight. Uh, of late, uh, the leadership at the very highest levels in the Fish and Wildlife Service, specifically our director, John Turner, has been very supportive of the dissemination of accurate biological information on the species, and uh, those of us that are involved are very appreciative of his support. Much has changed in the scale at which biologists, wildlife biologists, gather information since Paul Arrington set about gathering the seminal information on predator-prey relationships in the Midwest. For instance, I was, certainly didn't do the, the work or very much of this work myself. Rather, I, as Paul indicated, served as a supervisor, a director uh, for a whole succession of graduate students and field assistants. 
These days, as many as perhaps 35 young men and women are employed by Oregon State University gathering information on spotted owls. Spotted owl field investigations have come a long way since Eric Forsman began his investigations in 1969. He was an undergraduate at uh, OSU at that point in time and convinced Howard White that uh, he indeed had hold of a, a unique animal biologically and that he could gather quality information on this critter and it had the makings of a, of a good graduate program. Eric and Howard struck a bargain that after Eric returned from service in the Army, this was Vietnam time, that uh, he'd have a slot in a master's degree program at Oregon State University. Uh, also kind of as a, as a sidelight, uh, last summer before he went into service, Eric took a female, juvenile female spotted owl into captivity. Uh, her name is Fat Broad. She's got a little weight problem. Uh, she's still alive. Uh, that makes her, I believe, about 22 years old. That's, that's a long time, and uh, it, she's been a really uh, uh, strong source of information on things like molt and vocalizations, uh, rates of uh, egg laying, uh, longevity, and things of this sort. Eric worked on his master's degree, or began work on his master's degree, as uh, Paul indicated, with Howard White. When Howard died, I continued as uh, his supervisor. Uh, Forsman uh, continues to work with spotted owls and lives in Corvallis now, works for the Forest Service and uh, is, uh, uh, remains perhaps the foremost authority on the biology of the animal. Uh, there are some other names that it's uh, incumbent upon me to recognize. Gary Miller, David Johnson, Kit Hershey, Keith Swindle, Frank Wag Wagner, Jim Thrailkill. Uh, they've all played lead roles in owl data acquisition efforts. It's a team effort, and I acknowledge the contribution of uh, a real fine group of uh, dedicated and, uh, and bright young men and women. I would also be a remiss if I did not acknowledge the agencies that have supported this work over the years. First, there are the cooperators at the Oregon Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit, Oregon State University, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Management Institute. Financially, we have received most of our support for the in-the-field studies from the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. These are the two federal land managing agencies that control those Western Oregon timberlands that the owls are utilizing. I suspect before we're done tonight, we'll question some of the ways that Forest Service and BLM have managed their lands and especially as it relates to uh, managing them for the benefit of the spotted owl. I think it's important right at the outset to recognize that through all these tough times for these agencies that they have continued to support the research efforts that is gathering data that wasn't exactly making their management decisions any easier. And uh, that's, that's worth, worth noting. Enough for background. What are we going to do here tonight? First, I'd like to talk to you about some of the biology of the spotted owl, try and acquaint you with it. it in my estimation, it's really quite a remarkable animal, and I want to see if I can't convince you of, uh, of that. I want you to get a bit of a feel for the old forests, the ancient forests of the Northwest. They're also truly remarkable. And then finally, we'd like to look at uh, some of the management scenarios that have a, been attempted and may be in the process of evolving at, uh, at the current time. So. Uh, with that, if I can have the uh, lights, please. Whoops. Here we go. Well, there it is. Uh, that's, that's the critter, the northern spotted owl. Uh, that particular animal, I think you can see on the right-hand leg, uh, carries a uh, blue, uh, blue leg band. How's the focus? How are we doing? Is it sharp or relatively sharp? It's getting worse. <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. We'll let him work at it in the back. If we get this in, uh, it'll be better. Oh. Okay, I'll try. Okay, is that, you'd get a lousy angle from down here. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the critter. Uh, they do not have red eyes. That's an artifact of uh, a strobe light in uh, low light conditions. <laughs> Uh, they have dark brown eyes. We talked a lot about Eric Forsman. Here he is. Uh, 
you'd think that after uh, we've spent uh, some 20 some years or, or more uh, working in the Pacific Northwest that you'd learn enough to at least take a rain jacket along with you when you go out in December. <laughs> well, guess what, friends? <laughs> uh, we don't. Uh, we're no better than anybody else. Uh, you need to meet Fat Broad. Uh, she's sitting on the, on the logger's shoulder here. Uh, this was a uh, centerfold from uh, Life Magazine uh, this year. There's a um, uh, probably was 1990 in review or some such title on an annual life issue and uh, it's a photograph of, a, of the spotted owl on, uh, on the shoulder of a logger. She uh, willingly uh, stayed there and posed for, I think Eric said they ran about 23 rolls of film to get the right expression on everybody. Some other of the, the folks, we want to make sure that you understand this is a team effort. Uh, this is Gary Miller on the left, uh, who's a longtime worker with the OWL program. On the uh, right in the green t-shirt is Kim Nelson. Kim is now leading an effort that's uh, looking at the marbled murelet, which is uh, a uh, small robin-sized seabird that's proposed for threatened status that it's got some peculiar associations with old forests as well. Okay, here's the forest. Uh, this is a photograph taken in the H.J. Andrews area. It's in the uh, Willamette National Forest, just a little ways east of the city of Eugene, Oregon. Uh, Eugene lies about 90 miles, excuse me, about 120 miles south of, uh, of Portland in the Willamette Valley. As you turn east from the Willamette Valley, you go up into the Cascades. And uh, at one time, there were very extensive forests, old growth forests such as this. Uh, now, they're considerably uh, more fragmented. This is uh, the problem. Sometimes this is referred to as uh, mobile homes for spotted owls. Uh, those, are, uh, those are big logs, folks. Uh, if you compare the size of those uh, sections to the uh, size of the uh, tires on those big trucks, uh, they're, they're big logs. Three log loads are common. On occasion, you still see a single log load. Part of the situation is uh, political. We'll kind of conclude the talk this evening on that. Uh, this is a uh, group of uh, congressmen, congressional staffers, that were uh, viewing a, uh, one of the uh, uh, new forestry or new perspectives in forestry uh, cut units on the Willamette National Forest last summer. And here, I guess, is the thing that uh, certainly uh, none of us anticipated when, when we started out, that uh, we'd eventually get to the point where uh, a uh, issue that started off simply as our curiosity about the biology of a pretty rare animal ends up being a, a national issue and uh, uh, ends up on the cover of Time magazine. I guess I first recognized it was probably getting to be a nationwide issue when uh, I uh, heard it mentioned on Saturday Night Live. That, uh, that was my tip off that we were in big time. Okay, let's, uh, enough of the kind of picture shows here to introduce the topic. Let's, uh, let's look at some of the biology. Uh, photograph of the owl again. We got, let's see what we can do with focus again. I guess that's about it. Um, <clears throat> there's three subspecies of uh, spotted owls. The northern spotted owl is in blue on the photograph, uh, extends from the southern portion of British Columbia on down to near the vicinity of uh, San Francisco. The, uh, it's replaced by the California spotted owl, other areas in California, and then the Mexican subspecies in, in red. Uh, <clears throat> the distribution of the Mexican subspecies in Mexico is based on precious few records and it's largely a hypothetical distribution there. Distribution, uh, everybody wants to know how many of them are there. Uh, it's a threatened species. Well, obviously it must be rare. Well, it's not particularly rare. Uh, there's quite a few pairs of spotted owls out there. These were what were estimated for numbers in uh, April of 1989. There's considerably more than that. However, the proportional distribution of pairs remains similar. So that uh, if you want to know relative numbers, this gives you a, uh, a good idea. There's, I would estimate now, there's something uh, on, the, on the order of about 5,000 pairs of spotted owls that we know of in the range of the northern spotted owl. Some of the specifics on life history. It's got um, some 
characteristics that uh, lead to its, uh, its problems, if you will. Uh, one that uh, stands in good stead pretty much is that it's a long-lived animal. We mentioned that the one in captivity had made it to uh, some 21 or 22 years. We have one bird in the wild that's at um, a minimum of 17 years of age. Uh, there's several that are in the, in the 15 area. They don't reproduce very young. Uh, they're a minimum of two years of age at uh, first reproduction. Most frequently, we suspect they're considerably older. They don't have many babies at any one time. Two eggs are, are the rule. Uh, they don't reproduce regularly. Uh, not every, they don't breed every year. It, on a population basis, it's more on the order of every other year, but some individuals will breed consecutive years for three, four years. Others won't breed at all for three or four years. So it's highly variable. The survival rate of juveniles is uh, perhaps summarized as being pretty poor. Uh, 11 to perhaps 19 percent are the values that we've been able to derive thus far. However, if you look at the adult survival rate, it's pretty darn good. It has to be if uh, birds can live as long as, uh, say, 17 to 20 years. So if you're living that long, you don't need to successfully reproduce very often so that uh, a, uh, a reasonably low juvenile survival is, is not too surprising, actually. What sort of habitats do they occupy? Well, it's the one in the upper left there that is the one that's causing us concern. It's the old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, these are incredibly valuable forests. A hundred acres of old growth forest out to the west of Corvallis. Uh, if Forest Service puts it up to sale, if you want to go out and, and purchase it, uh, for the privilege of sticking a chainsaw in it, you're going to pay someplace between one and a half and two million dollars. That's not the value of the processed lumber. That's the standing trees on the stump. That you, that's what you'd be paying the Forest Service or BLM to get in there and get at that timber. It's incredibly valuable. And the trick with the owl is it uses a lot of this timber on the order of uh, several thousand acres per pair. What are some of the characteristics of these forests that the animal occupies? Well, this schematic shows uh, a number of them. Uh, the basic one is you've got to have some big trees. And in order for trees to get really big, they've got to get pretty old. If you've got real high site quality, they get big quicker than if you're on a poor site. But you need some big trees. Those big trees don't live forever. When they die, they'll form a snag, or they may fall over directly onto the ground and become a big log, big log on the ground. Those are both snags and, and logs, big ones, are prominent characteristics of old growth forests. The other thing that's very characteristic of these forests is a pretty high, <coughs> excuse me, pretty high canopy closure on the order of uh, 70 to 80 percent, someplace in that vicinity. But it's also patchy. Old growth forests are, are, are not uniform. They're not rank after rank, regularly spaced big old trees. Uh, over the course of three, four hundred years, lots of environmental inv events occur. There's rainstorms, there's lightning strikes, there's bugs that uh, get in and chew on individual trees, and there's openings created. With the openings, you get uh, light coming to the forest floor and you get regrowth. It's sometimes some Douglas fir can make it into some of these openings if, the, if there's enough sunlight. More often, it just stimulates the development of western hemlock, western red cedar, or some of the deciduous species, madrone, there's oaks play an important role. Hardwoods in general play an important role in the understory of uh, these old growth forests. We're hearing a lot these days about uh, another conifer species, uh, the the yew, the Pacific yew, as you've heard about it as a source for taxol, a uh, drug that uh, may prove to be very effective in uh, addressing certain forms of cancer. Here's a photograph taken in the H.J. Andrews, uh, again west of, excuse me, east of Eugene, Oregon, uh, in an old growth forest. I think you can see in it many of the characteristics that were depicted on the uh, diagrammatic uh, slide. Uh, a lot of those, uh, several of those big straight stems that you see there are in fact not living trees, they're, they're standing dead ones, snags. Uh, 
it's hard to take a picture in a, in a forest when it's several hundred feet tall. Even wide angle lens don't, just don't give you the uh, proper perspective. But you can see the uh, logs on the forest floor, the fact that there's a number of layers in that, uh, in that canopy. Here's one of those chance uh, environmental events, a windstorm in the uh, forest has uh, laid waste to a, a group of trees. Uh, again, check the size of those uh, trees where they've been sawn through so that the folks can get through on the trail. Uh, big trees. Uh, the color of the, uh, the light colors on the, some of those deciduous trees in there, the uh, conifers, would indicate uh, you know, that some light is getting through that canopy. It's, it's not a dark, dense, gloomy forest. It's uh, real patchy and there's a good bit of light gets to the forest floor in places. I've got a real high-tech pointer here that I just have to use, okay? Here's a photograph that's hard to, hard to come by in, uh, in Oregon these days. Uh, this was taken up in the vicinity of Crater Lake. Uh, it shows a pretty un unbroken expanse of, of forest. I'm not sure how old all this forest is. I shouldn't pretend that this is an unbroken expanse of old growth forest. But when white man first arrived on the west coast, someplace between 50 and 70 percent of the forested area west of the Cascades consisted of old forests. These would be forests in the 200 year old age category and older. We've uh, gotten right with it since then. Uh, here is a scene that was uh, taken now uh, looking at Mount Hood in about 1980. This would represent, I believe, what we all would have considered uh, good forest management practices uh, as of uh, circa 1980. Uh, it's patchwork clear cutting. Uh, the clear cuts are the appropriate size for that time. They're small. They're not uh, huge clear cuts running across the whole landscape. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that uh, there's, there's reproduction occurring in those cuts. I, I'm going to fool with the focus once more. <coughs> It's a try. Um, foresters are uh, very adept at reforesting areas. If they're working in decent site quality lands, uh, they get uh, young trees reestablished after a cut. So it's not a question of not being able to replant and reestablish trees. However, that scene is a far cry from an expanse of old forest. Uh, what man has done here is to lay a pretty heavy hand on a natural system. And the intent, as of still at this point, is to manage those cut units so that they, when they get up to about 60 to 80 years of age, they're going to be harvested again. Uh, when you do that and convert the whole landscape to a series of patch clear cuts varying in, in age from 0 to 80 years, uh, that's pretty well a, a prescription for the extinction, local extinction of the spot at all. We hear the term forest fragmentation a lot in, in conjunction perhaps with another term landscape ecology. These are uh, kind of current ecological buzzwords and, and they're important ones. They're also hard to, um, hard to understand perhaps. It's hard to differentiate between forest fragmentation and the simple uh, removal of old forests, the reduction in acres of, uh, of old forests. Here certainly though you would, uh, I think everyone would agree that this is a fragment of forest that's left up there. And such fragments are not very effective for interior forest species such as the owl. Again, uh, someone, in this case uh, Congressman Bruce Vento from Minnesota who's chairman of the uh, uh, interior, uh, one of the interior subcommittees dealing with uh, parks that is looking at uh, ways of legislating solutions to old growth forests. He was out visiting uh, some of the uh, forested areas here last summer. I don't want to leave you with the impression that spotted owls are found only in old growth forests. Uh, I think I've probably led you uh, pretty far that way by the, my comments so far tonight. Uh, this is Joe Lint from the Bureau of Land Management uh, admiring a uh, redwood stump uh, near Arcata, California. 
Uh, the forest that uh, had been standing there was home to spotted owls. Those little patches of uh, trees that you see in the background are currently supporting spotted owls. It's a uh, mixture of uh, redwoods. You can see there's a lot of hardwoods in there. There's also some Douglas fir. Redwoods develop very rapidly on the, uh, by virtue of their uh, specific characteristics. There's uh, a very benign, uh, favorable climate uh, for tree development in uh, northwestern California. And these forests develop at a relatively early age. Many of the characteristics that forests in Oregon, farther north, attain only after perhaps 150 or 200 years. And as a result, we've got owls present in these redwood, regenerating redwood forests at 60 to 80 years of age. So far, we don't know how successful those owls are in those situations, whether or not, in fact, they are reproducing and living long enough so that they are, that reproduction is balancing mortality rates. But they are certainly present there. A shot of our, our star for the night here. Uh, here's the fun part with the animal. Uh, it's unafraid of humans. Uh, here one has uh, joined a bunch of us on a log landing for lunch. We didn't call to it. It just flew in and joined us. It sat there for half an hour while we ate lunch and just watched us. Uh, I suspect the reason may be that uh, it had been fed a mouse a time or two that summer and uh, knew that mice came from groups of people that came out to see it, so it arrived for that reason, perhaps. But they are unafraid of humans. When you call to them in the spring, uh, they'll respond. They uh, will talk back to you. Uh, they will approach you. If you imitate a spotted owl call, I'll try it here. They'll respond. When they, uh, when they do, they'll, they'll come towards you uh, to investigate the supposed intruder into their territory. When they come in close, you can present them with a prey item. Uh, we use mostly white laboratory mice. They don't seem to mind the, that the color is a little strange. Uh, they'll come down, pick up that mouse. from. They'll take it virtually out of your hand. Uh, they'll lug it back to mom and the kids in the nest. And you can test to tell whether or not a particular pair is uh, breeding or nesting by whether or not they uh, take the prey item back to the nest. Another photograph of Mr. Forsman. Uh, this was in his somewhat younger days. And uh, he's letting a, uh, an owl take a mouse off his shoulder. The more routine manner of capturing the birds is to use uh, a long-handled or a long-handled pole. That doesn't make sense. To use a uh, extendable fishing rod. Uh, the uh, to the tip, you attach a piece of uh, uh, weed eater uh, monofilament that makes a, a nice heavy noose, and just run it back down through the butt of the pole. David Johnson here is in the process of slipping a noose over the the neck of an owl. Uh, catching it, you can see the arc in the, in the fishing rod there, and as rapidly as possible you lower it to the ground and subdue the critter, and then you proceed to perform all the sorts of insults that biologists do when they get hands on a live animal. We weigh it, we measure it, we get wing cords, uh, we band it, and probably in this case I think we installed a radio transmitter. When it's done, bird's released. Uh, that has got to be the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to that adult owl. I don't know how old it might be, five, six years old. Uh, it's just been grabbed and subdued and handled for half an hour, and you can hardly imagine anything uh, more traumatic occurring to a, uh, to a beast. Uh, so what's it do when you release it? Well, it's probably going to fly to the nearest convenient perch, 20 yards, 15 yards away. It'll sit there and kind of fluff up and uh, be a little disturbed and might squawk a couple times at you. The great thing is, if you pull out the mouse again and present it to them, they're very apt to come right back down and take the mouse. <laughs> it's kind of like when mom's on the nest with the kids, there's a switch flipped up here, and if you see a piece of prey, you go get that prey and haul it back to mom and the kids. It, it makes for uh, just a, a great animal to work with. Uh, all of us have had experience trying to work with um, other predators. Uh, most wildlife responds negatively to humans. Here's one that uh, is just a, 
a real joy to work with. So what do we uh, after? What do we do all these insulting things to the animal for? Well, uh, radio transmitters have uh, proved an invaluable source of uh, information. Uh, here is a uh, set of uh, radio locations uh, connected by lines, just running between adjacent locations. Uh, there's the time interval between those uh, locations may be anything from about 15 minutes to as much as several days. So you should uh, the lines connecting the points don't mean anything. They're just lines uh, through time. They're, they don't mean that the owl traveled that route at all. However, uh, what sort of habitat did that owl choose to utilize? The green habitat is old growth forest. The other age or the other colors are younger age classes. Does the owl select for old growth forest? I don't think you need to use much in the way of statistical tests to say, hey, yeah, I, I agree there's uh, some level of selection for old forest. Uh, is it just one bird? No, it isn't. It's all the birds that we've studied essentially show that same level of s selection for forests with old growth that are old growth or old growth-like characteristics. Uh, this is an animal that uh, was on a U.S. Forest Service holding that where the forests were more or less continuous. And uh, in the uh, center area here, this is a, a, a relatively high, uh, hesitate to call a mountaintop, at least a, a, a protuberance uh, through the forest where uh, you're getting above uh, preferred habitat for the owl. So it was kind of going around that. But again, it's obvious, even though there's a lot more of the old forest available to this animal, it's still just as a selective for it. Here's a uh, owl that was using some BLM lands. Uh, this would be one square mile. It was going a long way to seek out those patches of old forest, the, the green areas. The home ranges of owls vary. They're larger in the north. In the Olympic Peninsula area, they may be on the order of uh, 12,000 or more uh, acres, really large. As you come farther south into the um, uh, Cascades and coast ranges of uh, Oregon, central Oregon, they're more on the order of four or 5,000 acres. About 2,000 acres or a little bit more of that four to 5,000 in uh, the central area of Oregon is going to be old forest. As you go farther south in the range of the animal, the home ranges tend to get smaller and the amounts of included old growth tend to be smaller. Here's some other uh, assemblages of uh, home ranges of animals. These were some adjacent pairs of owls that were tracked. It shows you the sort of uh, patterns that uh, develop from the radio telemetry locations. It also in the, in the lower portion here shows the overlap between males and females of a pair and of adjacent pairs. So there's a, a considerable amount of overlap, especially between members of a pair, but also between adjacent pairs. They don't use the entire home range all at all times of the year. The Largest home ranges are generally used during the winter. The, the smallest areas are used, not surprisingly, during the nesting season. This uh, star right there represents the uh, eventual nest site uh, for that, uh, that bird. Here's a busy slide. Um, 632 or 36 uh, dots on that map. Quick count them. Uh, the, uh, this was the state of the art or the state of uh, knowledge on spotted owl pairs in about 1980. We have now have all oh, pushing 2,000 locations on uh, where we've located spotted owls over the years. The level of intensity of our effort has increased dramatically in the last several years. However, the, the pattern that's exhibited here remains the same. Uh, the virtual absence of locations up here in the northwest corner of the state is still there, despite a lot of looking. The absence of locations down here in the vicinity of Coos Bay, Oregon, is still there. The stuff up here, many of you may have heard of the Tillamook burn. Uh, 
a large fire in uh, the 30s, repeat burns through the 40s. It's since been uh, reforested, that whole area is forested, but the trees aren't very old. They're on the order of 40, 50 years old. And there is a virtual absence of owls in the northwest corner of the state. The areas that didn't burn are in private ownership. Uh, they've been uh, harvested and there is essentially no older forest present in northwestern Oregon and there are no or essentially no owls there. Certainly no one would claim that there is a viable population of owls present. Here's another way of looking at uh, habitat selection. Uh, the number of sites, this was out of uh, uh, a total of 1,500 sites as of uh, 1984, uh, 1282 were associated with old forests. Uh, the next biggest category was here where you had a mixture of old and mature forests. But you gotta be careful. See down here? There still are some of those. I, I guess one of the things that we have to learn as biologists is that you never say never or always uh, because that's almost never the case. This is a young owl. <clears throat> pretty easy to, to tell. You can see some uh, down around the nape of the neck. That's the last place where the feathers are replaced. They've also got another real neat characteristic, kind of a uh, biologist's uh, uh, assist. Look at the tips of those retrices. They're white tipped. They retain those juvenile retrices for about 22 months so that for the first 22 months of life they're marked as a juvenile. When you see one you can immediately tell the age of the owl. Uh, a real nice uh, handle that they've given us. What do these um, critters eat? If we know what they eat, then maybe we can uh, better understand how we might be able to manage forests to retain them. This is a northern flying squirrel. Uh, in various areas of the um, owls range, in, from about the center part of Oregon on north, it's the predominant item in the diet, perhaps as much as 40% of the diet of the spotted owl is composed of northern flying squirrels. That's a tremendous proportion. The dusky-footed wood rat replaces the flying squirrel as the principal prey item as you go south from about the Roseburg area. That's about the southern uh, third of Oregon on into uh, northern California. This is the red tree vole. That's uh, uh, another um, common item in the uh, diet of the spotted owl. All three of these are uh, nocturnal, arboreal, or semi-arboreal -ar mammals. Uh, this little dude is, um, uh, we, we run into weird animals in the northwest in old growth forests. It may live its entire life up in the top of a Douglas fir tree or trees. Uh, it feeds apparently exclusively on Douglas fir needles. It uh, achieves uh, its water either through the needles or through fog drip uh, off the needles. Uh, really some remarkable life history strategies that have developed. We're going to talk about reproduction in owls and uh, this looks like it might be a prelude to such but if you look close, uh, what do you see? You see some uh, white tipped retrices. Uh, that's actually a, a young owl uh, begging food from, a, from an adult. So. Uh, don't be led astray. But we will talk about reproduction. Let's talk about where, where do these critters nest. Uh, this is perhaps the most common sort of nest site. It's in the uh, broken off uh, top of an uh, old Douglas fir tree or western hemlock tree. Perhaps 150 feet up. Uh, when the top snaps off very often, a secondary canopy of uh, branches will again try and uh, form a, a, a crown. Uh, partially cover, shade, uh, shelter a uh, nest site such as this. That's probably the, the most common or certainly one of the very most common nest sites. They use all sorts of nest sites. Uh, owls can't build their own nests, so they've got to use uh, some preformed uh, structure. Uh, mistletoe infection is uh, pretty common in uh, ancient forests. Uh, owls will find a um, a place and just kind of burrow in and we're into a patch of, or a bunch of mistletoe and uh, perhaps an area where some trash has accumulated there or a, a, uh, a wood rat perhaps might have uh, been in there working on a nest and they'll use that as a nest site. Uh, it's uh, 
not easy to climb up into the top of a big old tree. It's, uh, it's done. Uh, you do it by shooting a, uh, an arrow over uh, the lowest branch, uh, s pulling up uh, first a, a leader cord and then a, a climbing rope and then ascending to that point with a set of Jumar climbers. So you're using essentially rock climbing techniques to, to get up there. Uh, we don't do it very often. It's uh, too much uh, work for the, for the biological return. Besides, we'd be run the